Science time. Science time. We're talking about today. <coughs> no. Science. Yes. Eighth grade science time. We're talking today about. Um, I'm going to call this one. Uh, let's just call it a spade a spade. This is called evolution and the geologic time scale. And the geologic time scale. This is, as you, even though you are but youthful and immature eighth graders, I don't mean immature offensively, you just haven't fully matured yet. Yeah, you're immature in the way that like a little baby tree is immature. You're not bad. You're, you're, it, you, a lot of times we say immature like, oh, I can't date him anymore because he's too immature, that kind of stuff. That just, that means something bad. But the, what I'm using immature to mean is that you have not fully matured. Anyway, in your immature state even, you're aware that there is some consternation about this point, right? You've heard on TV or Fox News or, which is on TV, or Pokemon, <laughs> you've heard that someone, maybe someone in your life even told you that's bad. You can't learn that because that's bad. But he, I'm going to give you the, the I'm going to spit some straight facts at you. Here's the first one. First of all, this is not about belief. This is what people agree upon. This is what the evidence suggests. Second of all, to the extent that you believe or disbelieve this, one, don't come at me because it's the state law. I'm required to teach this, which is fine. Two, you don't have to believe me, but don't, this is what I'm asking you. I'm begging you. Don't believe me if you want, but don't believe your pastor or your mom or your dad or your aunt or uncle or whoever. What I'm saying is don't just take a chunk of this and believe it at face value. Find your own evidence, and if you read all these articles or whatever, or find your own follow or whatever, and you have a decision about how this applies to your life, then that's fine. Okay, I will, I will accept that. I don't want to talk about it. Um, I want, but you make your own decision about this. Take the evidence I'm going to present you, take the evidence that you find at church or at home, and take all of that together and try to make your own explanation, because no one knows the way things really are. This is what we've been talking about the whole time. No one has the whole truth. We can't go back in time and say, oh yes, this dinosaur is walking right now, here are its feathers, here are its eggs that it's laying, etc. We can't see that. No one knows the whole truth. All we can do is take all the evidence that we have and present it as one unified theory, which is what evolution is. And remember that a theory is an explanation of events. It's not just describing the way things are, it's explaining them, explaining why they happen this way. And the best explanation we have for that, with the evidence that we currently have, is evolution. Is it totally right? Probably not, but we adjust it. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying to you? This is, one, I'm, try I'm not trying to avoid the consternation, but it's because I don't want to spend our time talking about it because we do have stuff we want to get through. If you want to talk about this with me privately, I do have personal opinions about it that I will share with you if you want. But we're not going to use class time for that. And then two, I want to make sure that you have the opportunity to take the evidence presented to you and make your own idea about it. That's what science is about. That is science. Claim, evidence, reason. You make your own claim, support it with evidence, and then explain the reasoning behind it. Do you have questions about that before we move on? The reason I say this is because I don't want someone to start saying things like, well, the earth isn't really that old because my mom says so. That's not a valid piece of evidence. Or a valid piece of evidence. And maybe she's right, even. That's not a valid piece of evidence, okay? Do you understand? And I'm not saying that this is good or bad or either, and I'm not just saying that to avoid trouble. I just really, I don't know. I don't know. Do you have questions before we move on? Hunter. The, the evidence suggests that people and other organisms are continually evolving. In fact, a lot of people will specify a difference between what's called microevolution and macroevolution, where the idea that we can literally see, like if you take a culture of cells that you can see in a microscope, and you do thing X and thing Y and thing Z to them, they will respond to that stimulus and they will evolve. We can watch that, but some people, in order to avoid this topic, the capital E evolution, they will call that microevolution, because we can literally see that. In the same way that I'm seeing you now, my evidence for your existence would be just as strong as my evidence for what we call sometimes microevolution. Yeah. So sometimes people that make that distinction, but in order to avoid having to talk about what you specifically said about humans versus monkeys, they will differentiate between microevolution, which we can literally see, and macroevolution, which is supported by evidence in the fossil record. But didn't humans, like, even over the last hundred years, get a little bit taller? Yeah, yeah. The, there, there is distinct evidence for change in the human race, but you would not, I don't think that evidence would be convincing to someone who doesn't already uh, have their groundwork in what we call macroevolution sometimes. And once again, I'm not, I don't want to get into the politicization of this. I just want to talk about it 
one, as the state standards suggest, and two, as the evidence suggests. And if you have other opinions about it, um, I will hear those later. Are you ready to move on? Yeah. Okay. I think so. That was my intention was to do while the thing was recording. Um, I is it is it not recording, Kendall? Is the microphone on, Kendall? Okay, yeah, everything's fine. We're all good. I'll cut that little bit there. Okay, so the the title of your book is not this. Um, first of all, because this is from the last lesson, the geologic kinds of field. We will talk about that first, and then the book terms this the the theory of evolution. It terms it or it titles the entire lesson patterns of change, which is we're going to talk about that too. But first. The geologic time scale. So we're starting with the geologic time scale. Um, the geologic time scale we can kind of think of as a loosely, I'm going to put loosely like a calendar of Earth's history. Loosely like a calendar of Earth's history. There are some differences between a uh, a real calendar that we use on a daily basis and the geologic times. What would probably be the most obvious difference between a real calendar and the geologic time scale? Hunter. It doesn't have months and days. Yeah, and that, I wouldn't say that's the main difference, but you're right. It doesn't have months and days. We will talk in a second about what the divisions are like, but there's one major difference. How, how long is a calendar recording time? 12 months. 12 months, a year, 365.25 days, however you want to say it. All those are fine. But geologic time scale is about the, the time from when Earth was first created until now. That's the geologic time scale. So on, on the one end, we, we like to put this on the bottom because it's geology. We put on the bottom the beginning of Earth. So uh, the, the creation of Earth, we'll put that there. Creation of Earth. And we agree that this is about 4.5. I'm going to put capital G, capital A, and someone's going to remind me what that stands for and how we use that unit. Give me a second. Remind me, please. Wait, isn't that yep, GA means billions of years. And why do, we, why do we use GA? Do you remember what it stands for? GA stands for the, the Latin words giga onum, which means billion years. So 4.5 billion years ago is when we agree upon the creation of Earth. And then that goes throughout for really, for another, I don't know, um, for another 3 point, or 3 billion years until 0 0.5 giga on them, which is also 500 mega on them. This is where we have what's called the Cambrian explosion. Have you heard of this? Someone said it as I was saying it. Have you heard of this? What is it? First of all, was it a literal explosion? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, it wasn't a literal explosion. It was a time when before there was only, there were relatively few kinds of life and most of them single-celled. And then after, all the kinds of phyla, all the different groups of animals that we have, most of the different groups of animals we have existed after this. M and multicellular life. So for this entire time period, really, it was mostly single-celled life. Mostly to all single-celled. Life. And didn't they all live in the ocean, like, yep. Off, like Yep, there was, land was sterile at this time, which means there was literally nothing. There were not even bacteria on land. Maybe on, like, the coastlines, there would have been some plankton or some bacterial growth. But in general, there was nothing on land until after the Cambrian explosion. Yes? Um, so I know that, like, sharks as a species are older than, like, the rings of Saturn, but, like, how much of the I'd have to look it up, but I, I think sharks as what we call a clade, as a group of organisms, um, if I had to guess, I'd say somewhere around three to four hundred mega on them. Wait, Saturn hasn't always No, Saturn hasn't always, nothing has always been anything, um, but Saturn has not always had its rings either. That's an interesting way to phrase that, Gabe. I'll look that up later. Yes? Um, so then for the next... For the next several hundred, until 250 mega ana, these are just the major points. I'm just going to point out the major bullet points. We call this the Paleozoic. Paleozoic. Can you read this word? P-A-L-E-O-Z-O-I-C. Paleozoic. And that's at 250 mega ana. What's 250 mega ana mean? 250 million years. 
And then from that time until, mm, I should probably make that a little bit shorter. From that time until 65 mega on him, we call this the Mesozoic. It's all one word, but I had to hyphenate it. Good job. And then from then until now, we call the Cenozoic. And I did not draw these exactly to scale. I could have used my meter stick to draw scale. But even just looking at the numbers, for most of Earth's history, what has Earth been like? What has life on Earth been like? Um, single-celled. Single -celled. Not, not even just mostly, but for 75% of Earth's history, there's only been single-celled organisms. The first dinosaurs were probably about here. The first humans were not even the thickness of this line. The first humans evolved probably about somewhere between 50 and 100,000 years ago. So the, not even the thickness of this line is first humans. Dinosaurs existed orders of magnitudes, hundreds of times longer than human beings have ever existed. Dinosaurs, really, if we look at all of Earth's history, what's the dominant organism on planet Earth? The dominant group of organisms? Humans. No, no, we've only been around for, I mean, the, the, through time. Most dominant. Not, not bugs. Bugs existed, really. The bugs you know about mostly started about the, the... There were some what we call arthropods, and there were even some insects before this, but most of the bugs you know about were started in the Mesozoic here. Bacteria. bacteria. Yeah, bacteria have been from way down here all throughout history. There are still bacteria. Viruses right along with them. They're, those are really... If we think about through history, what is the dominant organism those are? Yes. Um, well, probably, it's likely, the question was what caused the Cambrian explosion. It's likely, and these markers, we're going to talk about this in a second, but these markers are usually the divisions, we say the divisions are based off extinction events, usually. Decisions are usually based off of extinction events events. Why would we choose that? Why not? So wh another way this is unlike a calendar is that you notice they aren't equal divisions. It's not every 500 million years or every 50 million years there's not a new one. Why? Why would it be better to base them off of extinction events? Because that's where more organisms Yes, that's why we use extinction events, but why not just make it every so often? What, what's special about extinction events? What, what's important about extinction events? Will? Yeah, it's, it's a large amount of organisms, and why is that important? Why base it off organisms at all, Hunter? Um, because after it creates more biodiversity, uh, more organisms evolve, and they evolve more biodiversity. Yeah. Because they have more biodiversity. Yep. You're right. There's something we sometimes call punctuated equilibrium, which is where after a large extinction event, more organisms can evolve afterward to kind of fill in the niches, what we call in biology niches, the jobs that the organisms do. But you're still not quite answering my question. Listen, why, why today? Remember, how do we get evidence for any of this? Fossils. fossils. Only fossils. We can't go back in time. So why would we use extinction events to form the markers, the divisions between our different time periods here? Why use, why use extinction events? Gunner. Because we can fill in the blank. Why? Why use extinction events? Because we can do what with extinction events? Will? We can say why there's this fossil no longer here, but there's Yes, because we can actually see and touch the fossils, right? All the evidence, we can use direct evidence for extinction events. Do you see what I mean? We use extinction events because there is fossil evidence for extinction events. We can see, if we look at a rock, if there's a magic rock column that had every single time in Earth's history. Um, we could see that below this line, organism X exists, and above it, it does not anymore. So there was an extinction event. A specific example, we can see that below this line, dinosaurs' fossils exist. But above that, there are no dinosaur fossils. Do you see what I mean? So we can, we can actually see the physical evidence, fossil evidence, supports our breaking it up into extinction events. Yes, Hunter. You're talking about, so the horseshoe, I'm not sure exactly, the, you mean the, of the organisms that are alive on Earth today, the one that we can see fossil evidence of the furthest back, you're, you're kind of locked in the mindset of multicellular organisms, I'm sure there are bacteria today that we can see their fossil evidence clear from almost the beginning of Earth, I would guess, I don't know of any specifically, but I think you might be right for multicellular organisms, yes. So, uh, would it ever be possible to time travel? 
would it ever be possible to time travel? You're traveling right now through time at a rate of one second per second. So probably not. Probably not back in time. This is the, called the geologic time scale. Nah, it doesn't really matter, Gabe, because it's never going to happen. Um, if you look on your exploration two from lesson one, there's a more detailed version of this um, geologic time scale. Do you remember this thing? It's colored. We usually have it colored. Um, and I, ha I have even more detailed ones than this that you'll get when we're in earth science. But for now, and for what we do, what I'd like you to do with this, you have this in your notes. Does anyone not have this in their notes? You need to have it in there because what we're going to do is when we take notes over the video, the man in the video is going to say, 250 million years ago, and you're going to write down what that was. So for, for the instance, that one, you're going to put the Paleozoic Mesozoic Extinction Event. Or he might say, 280 million years ago, and be like, oh, well, that's in the Paleozoic. Do you understand what we're going to do? So we're going to use this calendar, this geologic time scale, to kind of tell what events were happening in there. And I think the video is a good way to do that, because then, first of all, I don't have to tell you all the events of each of these. And second of all, you can see it, and it's kind of cool. Um, now we're going to move on to talk about a different thing. So make sure you have this copied down, and we're going to start talking about uh, what we, the theory of evolution. Which, um, another thing people will say on Facebook, the comments are disabled for this video, you can send me an email. Uh, but another thing people will say on Facebook is that it's the theory of evolution, so it's just a guess. But that, remember, that is not how we use the word theory in science. If you say theory in your daily life, like, I have a theory, I had this theory that the grocery store was open yesterday when I came into town. And it wasn't. What did I mean when I said theory? There. Yeah, I, I had an idea. I had a guess, basically. But that's not what theory means in science. In science, theory means a reason why, an explanation that's based on all the evidence we have. If even one piece of evidence comes along and is not in line with that theory, we have to change the theory. I mean, like, for instance, when I say all the dinosaur fossils are down here, if we find one little Tyrannosaurus rex fossil, even right here in the rock column, we have to change the entire idea, the theory, of how dinosaurs went extinct. Do you see what I'm saying? Theories rely on all the evidence. And so the theory of evolution is based on every piece of evidence we have so far. This is what fits the best. And maybe it's not perfect. In fact, we know it's not perfect. But maybe, but this is what we say for now. Yes, Hunter? How is it possible that an entire like, species can go extinct? Not just a species, but like a whole family. Yeah, but like... You, does anyone still need this? Yeah, what are they? It wasn't one T-Rex left. But the, there were dinosaurs left, but we call them a special group of dinosaurs we now call the avian dinosaurs, which is the Latinate adjective that we use for birds. All the dinosaurs that still lived eventually became birds. Yes, Will? Um, so... May I? Can I erase? You found something like the... So, pretend there was... The... So, the fake set. Okay. okay. Yep. And you found the animal in this specific place. What would that do to them? So you're saying if we found a fossil of a Sasquatch, yeah. and then we also had a if we found a current example of a Sasquatch, yeah. it'd probably just change our theory of Sasquatch. Like instead of it being considered a crypto animal, we'd just be like, oh, it's a real animal. Come on, like you know, like like it was the same with the coelacanth. I one specific example of the theory of evolution being adjusted is the coelacanth, which was a fish that has lungs which is obviously important for evolution, because fish without lungs, fish with lungs, amphibian with lungs. You can see the progression. That's about change in life that we'll talk about in a second. But it was thought that that organism had gone extinct. We had fossils of it. But then a, a real live one was caught off the coast of South Africa. And so they changed. Instead of it being about the extinct coelacanth, we can now have a live coelacanth. You see what I mean? So just new discoveries are made all the time. Okay, so the first thing we're going to write down is that a, a, a basic definition of evolution that does not get people's panties in a twist is a change excuse me a change in mm, I'm trying uh, the what I want to say is allele do you guys know what alleles are okay uh, it's a trait that co is coded for by a gene but we'll call it we'll I'll kind of break that down so a change in change in the frequency of genetic traits, we'll call it that. Genetic, do you know what I mean by that? Okay, genetic traits over time. That's a basic definition. We can see this happening. You'll, I'm sure someone would still, if the comments were enabled and if people actually watch these videos, I'm sure someone would still put a comment about um, that what I'm about to say is untrue, but we can see this happening in bacteria. You know, like if we have a group of bacteria and we give them 
substance X, and that makes it so most of them die. But the ones who don't die have more bacteria babies. And then over time, the frequency, the amount of bacteria that have that trait X increases over time. That's literally the definition of evolution. We can see that happening in the laboratory. We know it's happening because bacteria that we've been killing for, we as human beings have been killing for almost 100 years with prescription uh, antibiotics are now resistant to those prescription antibiotics because only the ones that live through it that have some weird genetic m mutation that allows them to live through it only those ones propagate and then those ones propagate and then those ones propagate so there's a change in genetic trait frequency over time that's evolution okay questions about that no one who knows really anything about science disagrees on that the the this disagreement comes from does this also happen in large-scale organisms? And that's what you need to get evidence from me and your book and some real reputable research and your pastor and your parents and whatever, and then fuse all that together, okay? But this, no one disagrees about. This is the definition we shall use. Is that understood? But let's talk about these genetic traits. Uh, you know that one curly-headed boy broke his arm. What's his, what's his name? Colton. Colton. Him broke his arm. Is that a genetic trait? No. Yeah, his children... If he, even if he finds a cute girl when he's old enough and married, he finds a cute girl who also has a broken arm and they have babies, will their babies be born with broken arms? No, because no, that's not how genetic traits work. Genetic. Yeah, your hair color, your nor like your non-dyed hair color, your eye color, um, the the genetic diseases you have, some, to some extent how tall you are, um, those are genetic traits. Those can be passed on to your offspring. Things like if you got your foot cut off in a diabetic accident, or if you got your br arm broken, or if you dyed your hair, those things are not passed on because they're not genetic traits. They are traits about you. Well, like if, you have the if you got the diabetes, that might be a genetic trait. That might, I shouldn't have used that. That was not a good example. Will. So you also got, I think, uh, the, the, we, yeah, and we will talk about those later on. You're right. That some traits are recessive, some are dominant, but if they can be passed on at all, they are genetic traits. And if the frequency of those genetic traits changes in a population, Gabe, be quiet. If, that, if the frequency of those genetic traits changes in a population over time, that's evolution. Okay? The evidence, what evidence is there that life has changed since the beginning of Earth? Well, if we had our magic rock column that goes all the way back to the beginning of Earth again, what kind of fossils would we find down here? It's mostly fossil evidence. No. What kind of would we find way at the bottom? Uh, yeah, bacteria, single cells. Okay. What would we find up here? There aren't fossils up here, but what kind of dead things do we find up here? Uh, Fox. Okay. <laughs> Very specific. Thank you. What else? Right here. Like this is not. These are not fossils. They're just dead things. What kind of dead things can we find? Uh, deer. Deer. Looking for people. Yeah. In general. Uh, in general. How, as, shh, as systems, as organized objects, how do these compare to these? They are more... Recent, new. Yes, they're newer, but they're also more... More younger, no. Yeah, well, they're more diverse. Okay, so there's more diversity. Diversity, and then we don't really say advanced, but we say more complexity. They are more complex. There has been a distinct change in the fossil record in organism diversity and complexity over time. And that's evidence for evolution. Do you see why? Because we see, if we, if we, first of all, if we apply Steno's principle that the oldest stuff is on the bottom, and in that oldest stuff, I'm getting real jazzed up, in that oldest stuff we find only simple organisms, and then in the more recent stuff we find more complicated organisms, and that trend is through, through, true throughout, that tells us that Genetic traits have changed over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What other pieces? I want one other piece of evidence that uh, we can see that evolution has changed over time. I'm looking for a specific one. It was in your explorations. What's that? Okay, so we usually use sedimentary rocks to find the fossils, but what other? There's one more specific piece of evidence that I'm looking for that tells us that genetic change has occurred over time, or that evolution has occurred. Hmm? Don't you remember from your explorations? I can, I'm looking at it right here. Yeah, and that's, that includes these two things, diversity and complexity. But I'm also looking for what we call transitional fossils. Transitional fossils. 
So things that organisms that are that link to other organisms. For instance, fish and frog. This is going to be a good drawing of a frog. Don't That's a beautiful drawing you don't be mean to me. I love it. Look, okay. Fish looks like this. Frog looks like this. There's something here in between that what that's like a fish in some ways, but also like a frog. And what it happens to be is that coelacanth that I was telling you about earlier that has lobe fins and it has lungs inside of it. And this coelacanth is a transitional fossil. You can catch an animal crossing. What, Gabe? So like an early 2000s Mustang? Like an early 2000s Mustang, right between the good ones and the other good ones, but it itself is transitional. Yeah, what's up? I'm not going to take Ty's DNA, but what would I do with it if I could? And then, like, mix it with a cat's DNA. Mm, yeah. No, I see what you're getting at. That's not how hybridization, which is another thing we're going to talk about, works. The question was, can we take a little boy's DNA and a cat's DNA and make a boy cat? The answer is no. You can't just hybridize DNA like that. Not usually. Do you have questions about our evidence for evolution as a general principle? I want. Do you have questions about the evidence for evolution as a general principle? Okay, do you have questions about the geologic time scale? Okay, so let's leave with my, I want the takeaway to be, I'm not trying to shove your brain into a box. I'm not trying to make you think or believe anything that you wouldn't normally think or believe. I'm trying to present you with evidence so that you can make a decision that is right for you. People, listen, people are not allowed to have their own truth. I don't believe that. You hear all the time these days, well, my truth is, but that, that there is a truth here, I, but I don't know what it is and no one knows what it is. And so if you use a lot of evidence, Yours may be just as well as someone else's. There is a real truth. Don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't know what the real truth is. There's a real truth out there. But for now, all we can do is pile up this evidence and see how it fits. Okay? That's all I'm asking you to do. Use evidence in your arguments and don't just say, well, my uncle on Facebook said this. <laughs> so you can't be right. That's not the real kind of evidence I'm looking for. Questions? No one's uncle better leave a comment on this video.